Welcome to the Cinema Gold Show with your host, Larry Lease. From the small screen to the big screen, we cover all the latest entertainment news. Join us on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube every weekday. Welcome to an all-new episode of the Cinema Gold Show. I'm your host, Larry Lease. Today we're diving in to our review of the Loki Episode 6 season finale as well as giving our review of Space Jam New Legacy. So join us as we dive into these topics and more. Marvel's Loki Episode 6 is a triumphant season finale that's low on action, while the stakes are nail bitingly high. Our first main topic is our review of Loki Episode 6. If you thought Marvel's Disney Plus shows were done with contact homages after Monica Rambeau's transformation in WandaVision, you thought wrong. The Loki season finale, for all time always, opened with another one. We heard iconic dialogue from other MCU films, including Vision's What is grief if not love persevering? Which went from a heartbreaking utterance to an instant meme earlier this year. As we pulled out from Earth and its blistering sun, and outward toward the citadel at the end of time, where he who remains, very old king, resides, but not before we were joined by the likes of Neil Armstrong, Greta Thunberg, and Nelson Mandela. Finally, we heard Sylvie calling out to Loki, open your eyes. She'd go on to say variations of the same plea throughout this episode. What makes a Loki a Loki? Mischief? Lies? Revenge? Our Loki experienced a breakthrough when it came to these quirks and failings and seemed resolved to make better choices. Sylvie? Yeah, not so much. Sylvie only saw lies and felt revenge for her own pain and the suffering of myriad variants as she sought the destruction of the TVA and ultimately the rebirth of the multiverse. I found myself just as much on her side as I was on Loki's and the creators of the show did a great job to get me there because Loki, King, and Sylvie all had valid points to make while arguing about whether to kickstart the infinite possibilities of the multiverse. Once you open that box, it's not easy to close, existentially or narratively. But we knew a multiverse of madness was on the horizon, and that Sylvie was probably going to be the winner of this particular argument. The Loki season finale reaped the benefits of getting most of its big action out of the way, in the penultimate episode's battle against Alioth. And I felt no disappointment that for all time always had about half an hour of exposition in store. We started this thing by absorbing a ton of exposition, and that's how we were going to bloody finish it. This time, however, it was exposition I absolutely yearned for. And Jonathan Majors King was there to deliver it in spades as I hung on his every word. How good was Majors as King, though? I found him to be an instantly terrific addition to the MCU. Despite his villainous appearance being signposted for quite a while in the sacred timeline, Kang at least appeared to be a thoughtful, clever, fairly amiable, and quite casual man who chuckled his way through an inevitable and dangerous come up upinance. But there are other versions of Kings out there who aren't quite so pleasant to deal with and I'll we'll almost certainly be meeting at least one of them in the upcoming Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. I suspect we may run into him again before that, but Majors has a unique chance to put in a completely different performance as King every time we see him. It seemed fitting that when we finally met King, he was eating an apple, a symbol of knowledge, immortality, temptation, and the fall of man and sin. Lucky has played with with all of these themes definitely throughout its run and continued to do so in this episode. The Wizard of Oz and Cherry and the Chocolate Factory vibes were still running strong in the finale. As Kang explained to Loki and Sylvie that he was tired and had decided that they were the perfect people to take over his majestic reign of the sacred timeline. And it all made for a definite improvement on the Matrix, Matrix reload, Reloaded similar but legendarily confusing architect encounter by actually making sense in a clear, effective, and right way. It takes a lot to write Loki into a place where he plays a fairly innocent pawn in a chess game, 
that he has no idea how to play, especially after we've seen him be several moves ahead in other MCU outings. But to have him be the voice of reason in that scenario was quite something. I may not have completely bought into the romance between Loki and Sylvie, but I did buy into the essential ways that they were too different to trust each other when push comes to shove. Kang managed to give Renslayer a bite of the apple before he met the end of Silly Sword by passing on some key knowledge through Miss Minutes. Renslayer and Kang are heavily connected in the comics, even becoming romantically involved at several points. So we can probably expect to see them on screen together in the future, now that she has ditched Mobius and the TVA and set out on her own quest. As Silly defied Loki, so Renslayer defied Mobius. But hey, that's free will for you. I was pretty gutted to find out during the episode's Planet of the Apes cliffhanger that Mobius doesn't remember Loki, and that their friendship is now entirely one-sided. But I trust that these two will reconnect at some point. I can only assume that Owen Wilson will return for Loki Season 2, and that assumption is just one thing keeping me happy right now as I bid goodbye to Loki for a while. I enjoyed watching every episode of this series, but I'm glad that in the Season 1 finale, we not only got answers, but actually saw one of the Disney Plus shows dare to impact the MCU in a major way. Far beyond the kind of personal character and power development we saw with Wanda and Sam. Yes, the multiverse has returned, and we have no idea what madness lies ahead. Only that a war beyond our wildest nightmares with King at the center of it is coming. Couldn't be more excited to find out what happens next, or how Loki and the rest of the MCU will play their parts as Phase 4 unravels. And now our second topic is Star Wars The Bad Batch Episode 12. Our review... Of Rescue on Ryloth. Rescue on Ryloth follows the Bad Batch on a daring mission to save Hera and her family. Warning spoilers ahead for episode 12 of the Bad Batch. Well, look at that. It's a two parter after all. The Bad Batch takes a bit more of a front role in their own show as they reluctantly help out in Rescue on Ryloth. The show still feels too entwined with everything else in Star Wars to have mass appeal. But this episode in particular learned more from Rebels than from the Clone Wars in terms of giving characters the time to talk to one another and allow, allowing beats to sink in between all the action. I almost hoped last week's episode was a one-off, just one story in an anthology, but I'm at the same time happy to see these characters back. It helps that everyone in this arc is just so charming. Twi'lek freedom fighters Cham and Eleni have been captured after the faked assassination of their senator. Their daughter Hera calls Omega, who convinces the Bad Batch, to help, despite Hunter's disinterest. Meanwhile, clone captain Hauser continues to have doubts about the Empire, but can't bring himself to act on them. There was a lot of conversation in the fandom over the last week about whether Hauser's control chip was malfunctioning or whether his doubt came from his personality and or friendship with the Sindolas. And a little more on that later. I like that the entire Bad Batch gets time to talk through their plans and air their opinions in this episode, which was refreshing. At the same time, the event of their position is grating. After all, these aren't proto-rebels. Instead, they're still shocked that the Empire would treat a citizen planet the way that Republic treated a separatist one. I don't mind the one-sided approach to soldiery, per se, since it fits the characters' perspectives. In addition, viewers are supposed to know that Batch aren't entirely in the right th here. After all, Hunter thinks the job is too hard and refuses to help the citizens, even when Hera wants to pay him double. Omega's appeal to family is tested, and it's only when she pushes that the Batch gets involved. But the amount of work some conversations or even gestures and postures do in this episode was its major unique strength. Even the rather generic Admiral Rampart looks tired and distracted at one point. There's also time to develop a little bit of a dynamic between Hauser and Crosshair, who's on Rampart's bedside 
guess his methods haven't been effective. That was also a nice reminder of the larger stakes. Remember, Crosshair is the Camino in to prove that investing in clones is worth the Empire's money. Last week, we saw fans on Twitter giggling over the reluctant Captain Hauser, who, well, is a very handsome clone. His closeness with the Sindola sh show his moral center. One, his control chip either doesn't affect or for some reason can't touch. Their conversation isn't revolutionary, but there's at least some stuff to unpack when it comes to the argument between Hauser and Rampart. I have mixed feelings about the episode's utter disinterest in whether Hauser's choice to act on his doubts is purely from the heart or has something to do with his control chip. After all, the answer has implications for Crosshair. The ambivalence toward which you all know I believe has been a weak point of the show from the beginning. To me, the movies seem to say the clone's control chips kicked in mostly when Palpatine invoked Order 66 in particular. But Hauser's feelings seem to suggest a good portion of Crosshair's loyalty to the Empire in the aftermath of the Clone Wars, is actually of his own free will. Is Hauser's decision all natural? I'm not quite sure, but the question and the dynamic between the three Imperials were fun. The last ten minutes of the episode feature a decent series of action scenes in true Star Wars finale fashion. They're impressive for the way they intertwine the tension around Hauser's attempt to sway other clones against the Empire, and for a particularly heart-wrenching occasion, here is first fight, flight. I adore that she was clearly over-enthusiastic, but competent. However, this episode doesn't quite balance its main characters with the Twi'lek plot as well. Since Hunter legitimately doesn't have any skin in this game, his team's job is less grounded in the plot and setting than here is or Hauser's. There's one major exception to the batch, mostly taking a backseat. Shout out to Tech, who doesn't have a ton of depth, but does just happen to be the trope in the five-man band I enjoy. His lack of emotion and nerd interest are usually portrayed as useful, but a bit off-putting, even to his brothers. He doesn't have any less characterization or competence than, say, Echo, but usually sticks to a side role, so it was especially satisfying to see him do some fancy flying this episode. Slowing a ship around to nearly a dead stop so Wrecker could take the shot. The other nice thing about this episode is that it doesn't go for shot. It's hopeful in the end. Pulling some characters out of a fire while making the viewer tense against the burn. It's already been established in canon that Hera's mother doesn't survive the early years of the rebellion. But I'm glad not to have watched her die today. While the show continues to fe feel inessential, the last two weeks have been very entertaining. And also managed to pack a lot of answers to the central question in the show, what happened to the clones after Order 66? It's turning out to be a hard question to answer, and at best, like today, it feels realistic instead of inconclusive. The answer might end up being that a lot of different things happened, and a lot of different people worked according to their interests. Rescue on Ryloth ends with Crosshair off the leash, further tying a mostly standalone episode to the wider story. Final topic, our review of Space Jam A New Legacy. It's impossible to watch Space Jam A New Legacy without comparing it to the original 1996 Space Jam starring Michael Jordan. The sequel, which features LeBron James as its basketball star this time, makes big strides in updating the premise for 2021, but ultimately acts as a calling card for Warner Brothers properties the way Ralph wrecks the internet was for Disney. There's still, however, a surprising amount of heart in the story, reminding audiences to stay true to yourself, but to keep things fun as well. The movie takes on the same beats of the original film. An all-star basketball star is trapped in a universe where he plays a high-stakes basketball game against a team composed of, by some measure, pro basketball players. This time, however, the stakes are more personal. The movie's LeBron James is a multi-championship winning social media influencing 
entrepreneur, basketball player who only wants his sons to focus on basketball. His son Dominic has greater passion for video game development and feels misunderstood that his dad won't let him be himself. After LeBron, LeBron rejects what is essentially deep fake pitch from Warner Brothers AI program AIG Rhythm, LeBron and Dom are kidnapped by the scorned AIG and trapped in the studio's server verse. LeBron is challenged to a basketball game where winning means saving his son and his likeness. However, the game of basketball, AIG challenges LeBron to, is based on a version from Dom's video game where participants play with style and fun rather than with the rigid fundamentals of the sport. It's a lesson LeBron struggles to learn throughout the film, which is more than enough time for Warner Brothers to showcase a huge chunk of its catalog of movies and TV shows. The original Space Jam placed the weight of the movie on Michael Jordan's back, but in this more fleshed-out sequel, LeBron has an engaging supporting cast of characters that, even outs, that evens out LeBron's more grounded performance. So while LeBron's performance in Amy Schumer's Trainwreck garnered him praise and confidence in leading the Space Jam sequel, it's harder to see his charisma past a string of lines that are nothing more than stern motivational mantras. LeBron's fictionalized version is just a 2D avatar of himself, ironically becoming the very thing AIG rhythm wants. However, when the script allows James to lean into being loony or playing the compassionate father, he's the ultimate showman athlete. Removing himself from his super superhero armor, Don Cheadle is an unhinged villain as the all-powerful king of the Cerebrus. Removing himself from his superhero armor, Don Cheadle is an unhinged villain as the all-powerful king of the Cerebrus. Channeling his unnerving spoof performance as Captain Planet, Cheadle's AIG pits son against father with a smile on his face manipulating their relationship all for his own gain by hacking into LeBron's social media feeds. AIG's ease of control of technology outside of the serververse is questionable, but also serves as a reminder of the larger surveillance state we actually live in. The emotional core of the film is Cedric Joe's Dom, who has defeat and hope written on his face as he sorts through this complicated relationship with his father. He avoids tropes of being either a jock or a tech fanatic by being both. He can be great at basketball, but his face lights up when he talks about his true passions in tech. It's surprising, and hard to believe at times, that LeBron wouldn't, be, wouldn't encourage his son to be the best in anything he wanted to do. There's no denying that the movie is visually exciting, inviting comparisons to Warner Brothers' similarly flashy Ready Player One. The movie seamlessly transitions through different styles, from Looney Tunes to Bruce Timm to classic Ben Day comic book styles, while also mixing in live-action modern and old Hollywood film aesthetics. The most impressive feat of the sequel is now incorporating video game design as a form of entertainment, and the CGI of the digital video game space is impressive. The Goon Squad is a team of elemental monster-human hybrids favoring to show more physical resemblance to the pro players over the exterior extended cameos in the 1996 movie. The worlds and characters also move smoothly within these dimensions, with only a few of the Looney Tuners looking a bit off. Yeah, we're talking about you, Bugs. The background live-action characters we see at the game, however, are distracting and underwhelming. It might have been better just to digitally insert actual movie characters instead of seeing unsettling Halloween costume versions of Pennywise sharing alongside White Walkers and Droogs. And yet, for all the spectacle, our Looney Tunes characters are sidelined and wasted in this sequel. Even Zendaya's buzzy casting as Lola Bunny gets lost when you have dragons and the exciting goon squad filling every second in the Sir Rivers. Warner Brothers faces tougher competition than it used to with Disney and Pixar's continuous output, the rise of adult-oriented animation and anime becoming more accessible and popular in the U.S. feels more like a passing of the torch. And that's a little odd considering the Looney Tunes brand has been revived on HBO Max, with new episodes and, if anything, 
This should serve as a revival of the franchise for new audiences or even a reminder for old fans. And that is all we have for this episode of the Cinema Gold Show. Let us know your thoughts by sending us a tweet at Cinema Gold Show. Let us know what you thought about Space Jam and New Legacy. If you watched it, let us know in the comment section below. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching the Cinema Gold Show. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to our podcast on all major platforms. Follow us on Twitter at Cinema Gold Show. And like us on Instagram at The Cinema Gold Show. Support the show by buying us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash cinemagold. As always, thank you for listening.